Hello, it's good to be back once again, and I hope you're all okay. Alright, let's go straight into this topic. Man-made religion versus holiness. Now some of you may ask me, why have I chosen such a deep topic? I will tell you right now, I'm deeply concerned about the direction of the church as a whole. And my concern brings me to my first question. What has the church become? Let's look at the main downfalls of the church. And I'll show you some examples. Number one, independent religions and ministries. Or, in other words, the breakaway. I'm sure that time after time we may ask ourselves, Why are there so many denominations? Or why are there so many ministries? Well, I believe it's because of pride. In Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12, it says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. And here we are today with so many ministries so many independent denominations where most people are preaching or teaching based on their own opinions or desires. You may even hear them say, I believe what the Bible says about dot dot dot, but, and you leave space for your own opinions. For example, I believe what the Bible says about fornication, but it's so hard to stay away from it. In Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You see, When we are inspired by our own desires, we are more likely to break away from God, our church, and walk down our own path. And we know where that path will lead to. We've been reading Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12. The end leads to death. We need to be influenced by the Holy Spirit in order to live holy. Look at the condition of the church today. So many people have their own desires. They don't want to live holy. Some people may say, I'll start my own church. I'll start my own church with a doctrine that suits me. Number two, church and society. It's a major concern that the church and society is mixed up. And we should know that it should never be like this. The church is supposed to lead by example. We're living in a time where the church is no longer the light. Society is. And that's why you hear people say, you need to keep up with the times. This is the voice of society today. And there are many cases where we have weak politicians and a multitude of weak politicians are Christians. And this is a major concern. When we consider the former American president, Barack Obama, he claims to be a Christian. However, under his leadership, same-sex marriage was legalized. When you're a politician you're more than likely to be a puppet. This is how I see it. And I need to say this. In society, where is your voice? In church, you may stand up for holiness, but in society, what do you stand up for? And I'm sure Obama did what he did for approval. He wanted to seek approval from everyone else and be remembered as the president who legalized same-sex marriage. 
and my message to every politician and everyone else in society is to stop being current and be holy. If you claim yourself to be a Christian, why not lead by example? Show other people how to live. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 14, it says, But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. How do we expect society to know about the smaller gate if we're not being Christians? We need to rise up and take our stand. Stand up for holiness. Stand up for Jesus outside your local church. And this reminds me of a song that says, Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Because Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Jesus, you. This is how society needs to be. This is how our church needs to be. Jesus being the center. And our prayer should be for Jesus to be the center of our lives and wherever we go. Number three, public holiday influences. Someone tell me, why are pagan celebrations taking place in churches today? For instance, what do Easter egg hunts have to do with Jesus? What do Christmas trees have to do with Jesus? And I know that there are some people out there who ask, is it right for a Christian to celebrate Halloween? And I'm sure there are Christian parents out there who send their children to Halloween parties. Come on, we need to lead by example. In John chapter 8 verse 12, it says, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Celebrate the light and not only do that, but carry the light. We also need to follow the scripture. Joel chapter 2 verse 13. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. We need to turn back to the Lord. And don't let any pagan ritual or celebration influence your church. Remove every item from your household or your church that has anything to do with pagan celebrations. Number four, pure entertainment. In Luke chapter four, verse 18, Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. I've included this scripture because so many preachers believe that the anointing comes from an organ and if an organ player isn't present they can't preach or they always feel the need to entertain their congregation. Remember what Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That shows humility. You don't need an organ, you need the Holy Spirit to guide you. And I'm sure that even if organs were invented in the Bible, I'm sure that Jesus wouldn't even need one. 
Why? Because he would always rely on the Holy Spirit. And my message to every musician, and I know that some of you do this, when the preacher comes on, stay in the sanctuary because you need the words as much as everyone else. And especially for musicians who, who are paid to play at churches, you may even hear some of them say, I only came to play the instrument or I only came to do what I was paid to do. Let me tell you that the word is as important as the worship. Remain in the sanctuary. And let me also tell you that your talent to play instruments come from the Lord. And now the controversial part. Number five. Preachers, scam artists. Can you imagine the amount of money that false prophets make selling miracle spring water, miracle cloths, miracle soap, or just by telling you to sow a seed into the ministry? And they put so much effort to make us feel guilty when we don't give a penny. Oh, God's going to put a curse on you. Will a man rob God? Why is money and other material things more of a priority than God? Why is it more important to have materialistic things than to live holy? And the truth is, we cannot play with God. He knows our hearts. He knows our desires. And we need to remind ourselves that money can never save us in this dark, chaotic world we live in. Only Jesus can save us. He paid the price on Calvary, a price that is more costly than all the economies gathered together. And now the important part, the way of holiness. In Leviticus chapter 19 verse 2, the Lord says, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. The same God who spoke through Moses is speaking to us. He did not tell us to be Catholic or Methodist or Pentecostal or be part of any other denomination. He wants us to be holy. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 where Jesus says And I say unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hear me carefully. Jesus did not start a religion. He did not say upon this rock I will form a religion and call it Christianity. The word Christianity does not appear in the Bible. The vision that Jesus had is for a wide group of believers to spread the truth. And no matter how many agendas Satan may have, it will never harm the believers in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 26 says, What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn, or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. This is the importance of the church, where we build each other up. Iron sharpens iron. We need encouragement. We need a song. We need interpretation of tongues. We are all human beings. We tend to fall from time to time. So we need our foundation to be scriptures like this, where we can pray for and support one another. And before I conclude this message, there's one final question I want to ask. How many of you 
are ready for change. Some people believe that if you come as you are, that will be enough. But my response would be, come as you are and be changed. And I do understand that the change won't happen immediately. It's a gradual process. But during that time, we need to be nurtured. And one of the main things that the Lord hates is when we desire to be changed, but we don't want to put effort into being changed. There are people out there who are happy just the way they are. And my response would be, which statement sounds better? I'm happy with my current condition, or I'm no longer what I used to be. Can you understand how, how powerful the second statement sounds? Even those of us who are already Christians, let me point you towards Titus chapter 3, verse 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Look what God has done for us. We need to remind ourselves and look back over our shoulder to remember where God has brought us from. And if he can do it for us, he can also do it for any non-believer. These supernatural changes remind me of a song. It says, What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. And the chorus says, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm tempted to add another song. It is summertime in my heart. It is summertime in my heart. Since Jesus saved me, new life he gave me. When it's winter, it is summer in my heart. Can I go a bit deeper with another old song? Okay. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened. And now I know. He touched me and made me whole. Like those of you who are listening, I'm also grateful and happy for the change that Jesus made in my life. Where would we be today if it hadn't been for Christ's transformation in our lives? Let me conclude this topic with another scripture. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You see, not all of us will enter God's kingdom. The question here is, will you be the person where God will say, I never knew you? Those words sound painful. And I hope that these words will bring conviction and whilst we are alive, let's do our best to live holy and spread the gospel as we anticipate the words we want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for listening.